and welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Um, it's great to have uh, so many of you with us for what is our May uh, Scholars Library event. And for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, since March of 2022, each month this initiative has allowed a Rhodes Scholar to come and talk about their literary works to those directly in the Rhodes community and also beyond it. Um, and it's lovely to have so many of you with us. So thank you for joining. Today, we are incredibly excited to welcome Professor Joseph Nye to talk about his memoir, A Life in the American Century. Uh, a scholar in residence, Zi Wang, is here to moderate the conversation today. Um, Zi is a third, uh, a third year DPhil candidate and a diplomatic historian specialising in post-Napoleonic Europe. She received her Master of Arts in International Policy from Stanford, where she also obtained her BA in History and French. Uh, whilst there, she worked at the Hoover Institution as a research assistant to Secretary Condoleezza Rice, working on political communication in China. And she's also competed as an elite golfer for nearly 20 years, um, having played on, amongst many other teams, the Chinese national team. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ziyi, who will give you a further introduction to Professor Nye and the session, and we can get into it. If you have any questions, uh, please do pop them in the Q&A as we go, and we've got some time towards the end to go through those. And I'll also pop a link to Professor Nye's book in the chat as well. Um, but for now, over to you, Ziyi. Thank you so much, Georgie. That's a very, very kind introduction. Appreciate that. Professor Nye. Thank you so much for your time. We're very grateful for your presence. And thank you for taking the time to, to see us, to speak to me and my peers last week at the Rose House. And uh, it's wonderful to see you again. So reading your book, Alive in the American Century, you begin with fond memories of Oxford, in fact. I would like you to take us back, please, to your journey and your exper initial experience at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. In 1958, you and other Rhodes Scholars were on board Queen Elizabeth from New York to Southampton before arriving at Exeter College. Aside from the cold and damp winter days, which many of us are very familiar with, you also talked about the difference between a capital intensive and a labor intensive class ridden economy. Could you please explain to us what that means and just describe your early days at Oxford? Well, in the beginning, uh, because of the common language, uh, there's an illusion that Britain and America are the same. I mean, that it's like going from one state in America to another. It doesn't take you too long to realize they're really quite different cultures. And um, when the labor intensives or capital intensives is a joke, which is that in Oxford, I had a servant, a scout, who brought me a pint of milk every morning, but I had no refrigerator to keep it in. At Princeton, I would have to go out to the store and buy my own milk, but I had a, a refrigerator to keep it in. Uh, nowadays, that difference is, is less uh, obvious between the, the uh, two cultures. But the, the point is, it illustrates the fact that... Uh, uh, <laughs> As one wit put it, uh, Americans and British are uh, two people separated by a common language. Oh, fantastic. That's great to hear. And ever since you departed Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, you've actually remained very involved in the institution, especially since um, leaving government in 2004. How has the institution evolved, Oxford itself? And looking at today, when we consider um, college campus protests across the world versus your own experience in the 1960s. Could you please allude us to your quote, society would be poorer if academics debased their search for truth and universities became just another pressure group? Well, on the, on the differences between uh, Oxford and, and the 60s and Oxford today, uh, the university has become somewhat more centralized. It's always been highly decentralized with power basically in the colleges. But I served on a uh, uh, commission for the uh, uh, vice chancellor to uh, make recommendations about the social sciences in the early 2000s. And um, what struck me is the departments were getting stronger. Uh, the colleges still remained strong, but the, the departments uh, uh, were nowhere near as strong in the in the earlier days. Um, and I think that's progress. Uh, 
On the question, though, it, it's more interesting. I'm comparing the '60s and the and today on student protest. I was struck in my recent visit at Oxford, uh, where there were tent encampments uh, mm -hmm. outside the uh, museum and outside the, uh, uh, I guess, pretty much um, in the square uh, in in front of the uh, Bodley and so forth. Mm -hmm. That uh, they were pretty civilized, um, and the same was true of the tent encampments in the Harvard Yard. I mean, uh, you know, there may have been some slogans that were unpleasant, uh, but, but basically um, it's quite a contrast to the 60s where uh, the, uh, the protests in the Vietnam period became quite violent. Mm -hmm. uh, my office was in uh, the Center for International Affairs, and uh, I, I had the uh, either fortune or misfortune of being given Henry Kissinger's old office when Henry went to to Washington, and uh, so I immediately put a peace sticker up on the window. Oh. It didn't stop bricks from being thrown through the window, and uh, and but it, it more serious. Uh, we had a bomb that exploded in the uh, library of the building. And uh, 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 protesters broke into the building several times and sent one of the staff members to the to the hospital with injuries um, and uh, just made an, an enormous amount of damage. Uh, so in that sense, the '60s protests were were much more violent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so far, I haven't seen anything like a bomb going off in this period. Well, hopefully, fingers crossed. No. Um, so going a little bit back to your time as a Rhodes Scholar, in 1959, this is incredible to read, that you wrote you had memories of Vice President Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev having a debate about the future of the Cold War then. You wrote, close up, the much vaunted empire looked far less foreboding based on your travels in the USSR. Do you think the same can be said about great power competition today between particularly the United States or and China or American foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific region. Do you think the United States still suffer from a lack of understanding of China? Well, I think there's definitely a lack of understanding of China. Uh, it's a little different, though, than uh, than in the Soviet period. Um, when we went to the Soviet Union in '59, I went with two fellow Rhodes scholars, John Sewell, who was a uh, West Pointer, and uh, uh, Sam Holt, who had been at Princeton with me. And um, what was different uh, then was uh, we were very, very rare. When we pull up at a at a, uh, a, a town or city in in uh, in the Soviet Union, um, we'd be surrounded by people as though we had come from Mars. I mean, there was almost no social contact. Right. On the contrary, there's a lot of social contact between China and, and Americans. I mean, there are over 300,000 Chinese students in the U.S. Unfortunately, the number of American students in China has dropped very badly in the post-COVID period uh, to about 1,000 or so. But I think uh, one could hope that that will increase. When I was in China... Uh, a couple of months ago, and I know Ambassador Burns, Nick Burns, was certainly eager to have more American students in China. But those types of social contacts, people to people, uh, are very important for getting a perspective. And it's also important for people to see uh, a competitor country close up and instead of demonizing to realize what are its strong points as well as what are its flaws. Uh, in, in back in the in our trip in '59, there's a widespread belief um, that the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things, that, and that's what Khrushchev boasted about in his uh, debate with Nixon. But one of the things that was most intriguing to me is that when you went to stay in a hotel and the, the hot water didn't work, or when you went to the restaurant and you had a a menu with lots of items, but none of them were available. It it suddenly made the Soviet Union seem a little less uh, daunting or threatening than it first seemed. 
And I think the uh, the same thing is true that more exchange between Chinese and Americans will get each um, side to have a better understanding. It doesn't mean they necessarily will solve all their problems. They won't. But it does mean that you'll have uh, less chance of miscalculation uh, than when you stay distant and just demonize the other people. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, after you finished your education at Oxford and after you obtained your doctorate, you had the choice between staying in academia and working in government. In fact, throughout your long career, you faced this decision many, many times. Particularly in 1978, when you were working in the State Department, you had offers from Princeton, Brookings, Harvard. So you were thinking whether to have the, the privilege to think more intellectually and broadly, or to have the ability to, um, to create tangible impact. And you wrote, at the State Department, your constantly overflowing inbox led to the urgent driving out the important. So how does, could you please run us through your thought exp um, experiment, basically? How do you make the decision of staying in academia or in government? Well, the, the uh, academia and, and government are very different in two dimensions. One is time and the other is power. In terms of time, uh, in academia, you can try to get a book or an article uh, just right perfect and to get it into a referee journal. And it may take you a couple of years. In government, uh, if you don't have a memo that's needed by tomorrow afternoon at the White House, by tomorrow afternoon, all the polishing you put onto it uh, is irrelevant. It's a failure. Mm -hmm. So time is enormously different. Uh, the other thing is power. In, in academia, uh, you're not or should not be trying to uh, ask whether the ideas that you're analyzing um, are going to be uh, politically popular or whether others are going to necessarily follow them. You're trying to get the answer right and, uh, and clear. In government, um, you have to think about, can I attract a coalition of people to implement these ideas? And, if, and that means you have to ask, when do I propose them? What form do I put them in? Uh, how do I get a group of people to want to push these ideas? And uh, those, are, those are very different aspects of, of what one encounters in life. I'm glad, frankly, that I did both. I mean, I, I would not have uh, enjoyed life as much if I hadn't had the experience in government and or academia. But uh, I guess if you say that one votes with one's feet, um, I've spent much more time in academia than government. And um, I think the reason is that you're allowed to uh, let your curiosity flow and pursue anything that interests you, whereas in, in academia, whereas in government, um, uh, you, ha you have an inbox of issues that you're responsible for. And you might say, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to look at that other issue? You just don't have time to do it. So in, in a sense, uh, government um, uh, is deeper. Academia is broader. I see. OK. Although when you were in academia, you did attempt to continue working on policy related issues. How was that experience? Was it a bit more frustrating than when you were in government itself? Well, it, it, when I when I left the um, um, Carter administration, where I'd been in charge of uh, nuclear nonproliferation for the White House, um, I uh, was struck by the fact that when I get got back to Harvard, that the, the courses that I was teaching were were too abstract. I mean, and I wanted students to have some ability to understand how you combine ideas and action. So I started a new course um, at the Kennedy School of Government um, in which the students were given a current problem, uh, had to read lots of things about the problem. Uh, and then they were required to submit a three-page memo of what they recommended as a solution to the problem. 
that's very different from the normal term paper, if you want, right. uh, that you expect in academia. And it was a way to try to to uh, bring some of my government experience back to to academia and get uh, a, a, a way to do both. Doesn't mean everything I did was like that. On the contrary, most of, uh, of the courses that I taught um, were standard, uh, larger form, but I did want to try to get a, a better understanding of what policy is life for students. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that you ended up spending more time in academia than in government. Um, and that became, um, well, the deciding point of that could have been in 1995, when you decided whether to accept the deanship of the Harvard Kennedy School. You mentioned that you took a five by eight card and drew a line down the middle, uh, laying out all the pros and cons, and eventually the pros for Harvard Kennedy School Deanship turn out better for you. What were these pros and cons that you had on the card? Well, I think it goes to to this question of breadth versus depth. And a way to illustrate it is that this was the second time that I was offered uh, this prospect of deanship. Uh, Harvard has a rule that you can only be away for two years to serve in government, or else you give up your tenure. Uh, so in 1994, I actually resigned from Harvard, resigned my tenure, because I had an initiative about policy in Asia, particularly uh, uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship, that I wanted to finish. And I said, it's more important to finish this than it is uh, to be called dean. Mm -hmm. um, then a year later, um, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, in which um, a uh, extremist in the U.S. Um, basically uh, killed over 100 uh, people who worked in government and also the women and children working in the daycare center, uh, that would be April of 95. I was really shocked by that because the people I was working with in government uh, were really devoted to the to what they were doing they spent long hours at, at relatively modest pay and this idea that they were uh, some form of a deep state that was uh, uh, hurting the country struck me as really odd so when harvard returned and asked me um, after that about two weeks after the oklahoma city bombing would i uh, accept the deanship i said um Yes, I would, because it would allow me to think more broadly about what's happened to trust in government. So I, I want, but I, but I said I wouldn't uh, accept it until I finished uh, the work that I was doing um, on uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship in particular. The Japanese called it the Nye Initiative. It was uh, efforts to say that the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, should not be discarded, um, but should be uh, reaffirmed. Uh, that occurred, and um, it was a major change in the, in the policy that the Clinton administration had coming in in 93. Uh, and I wanted to see that nailed down. But after that was nailed down, um, in Clinton and Hashimoto signed an agreement on that in the uh, uh, early 96, um, the, uh, I, I thought I, I wanted to let my curiosity roam more free, freely over this question of what was happening to government uh, in an age where we were already beginning to see the beginnings of the internet and globalization was growing rapidly and so forth. So the, the, the pros and cons were pretty much along the lines of that uh, deeper versus broader that uh, I think separates academia and government. Fantastic. I think when you first decided to uh, return back to the broader and your first return to Harvard at the uh, at the end of the 70s, you were experiencing adrenaline withdrawal, in your own words. And then at this critical moment in 1979, you were offered to return to DC as the Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs. You were tempted but then you waited. You decided to wait until after the 1980 election, where, um, to your surprise, Jimmy Carter failed to be to be elected. 
Is the 1980 election a point that you look back and wondering what if? Well, it, it, it yes. I mean, of course, uh, if I had uh, stayed in uh, in government instead of going back to Harvard, if I had resigned my tenure in 78, uh, as I did uh, later in 95, um, I, you know, I might have risen to higher levels or or in government or become a more significant political figure. Um, but I, I it, it, frankly, I, I don't regret it at all. I mean, I, I've not only liked teaching and research, um, but uh, it was important for family. Um, our, our three sons were then uh, young teenagers. And, um, you know, it's not long before teenagers don't want their parents around. But at the early teens, um, it's probably a good thing to have closer parenting. Um, and so uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time thinking about that and decided it'd be better for the family uh, to be back home uh, in Massachusetts than to stay on, even if the political options were, were higher in, in Washington. So I don't regret that at all. The three boys turned out okay. Oh, incredible! Did they do not work in government or policy? Uh, well, actually, one of the one of them uh, worked in the Treasury Department as a special assistant for a couple of years. Um, uh, so he 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 did get some government experience, but uh, all three of them are actually in the private sector. I but see. I should say the the reason all this worked out, I don't get the credit. I, my wife gets the credit for extraordinary perspective and patience. You it, you actually uh, had such humorous writing regarding uh, your family life where you wrote about being cha chased by a bear in nature with your boys and also um, describing how you're the perfect gallery husband um, when you're going to art galleries with your wife. And that's, that's wonderful. To, it shows the human side of, of you versus just looking at your resume. You seem like this formidable um, formidable politician or um, scholar. But on that note, regarding the balance between your personal life and your career, um, you wrote fondly about fishing, about going to parks, to the mountains. Were there ever moments, I'm certain that there were moments where the demands of your work took away from the tranquility that you would enjoy. How did you actively put in an effort to maintain that, the balance, the safe haven of your personal life? Well, I think it's crude crucial for anybody, whether they're in government or working for a company or nonprofit, I think you have to have um, something that counterbalances the intensity of your work. Um, it, it, there's a great uh, uh, temptation or tendency to let work to dominate our lives. And I think we're, we're less creative and uh, uh, less successful in accomplishing our tasks if we are doing only our work. So uh, going on these fishing trips in Alaska with my sons, where we were indeed chased by a grizzly bear, uh, but we were you know, going out in the wilderness and being uh, responsible for, for your own uh, campment and not seeing any other people. This gives you a very different perspective than you get when you're constantly going from embassies to Congress to the White House and in Washington. I think, it, I think that perspective um, is important. So, and, and if, you know, if you're not the type who likes to go uh, out in the woods or climb mountains or whatever, um, uh, you know, art and music are essential to that perspective too. And uh, so I think, um, I think, the general point was, is I look back, I think that it wasn't that there is obviously a competition for time. I mean, if it, you know, you, you don't have much time when you're in government uh, and your tendency is not to take your vacations. But I think it's a mistake to to not take your vacations. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're better at what you do if you, if you take them. Noted. We'll keep that to heart, definitely. So um, after 1980, in another unexpected turn of events at um, the 1992 election, 
you returned to government the following year after Clinton's success. So you had the choice between chairing the National Intelligence Council and or becoming the Assistant Secretary of Defense. You describe these two options of choosing between the temptations of omnipotence and omniscience. How would you compare these two aspects of government working in intelligence and defense? Well, it, I, I chose the intelligence role first, uh, chairing the National Intelligence Council that prepares intelligence estimates for the president. Um, uh, it gives you an extraordinary overview of information. Um, you can you can basically uh, tap into uh, ranges of information that are are uh, are basically wider than uh, what one normally experiences. So I had I en enjoyed that. On the other hand, um, you can't implement things if you're in intelligence. You're supposed to observe and analyze, at, but not uh, not put your hands on the levers. And uh, so I would go to meetings at the White House where, after giving the briefing about what the situation was, uh, you have to shut up. Mm -hmm. I said to the book like a good Victorian child after your initial presentation should be seen but not heard. Um, but I, I was out of sorts with the administration's policy on uh, Asia and Japan, and um, I, and I wanted to try to do something about it. So that's why having turned down the Assistant Secretary of Defense to do intelligence, uh, I after a year and a half, I changed my mind and went into intelligence because I, I mean into the Pentagon mm -hmm. because I wanted to try to implement some of these ideas and I was able to, to change the policy and I couldn't have done that from intelligence. Um, about the title of the book, The American Century, you started to mention the term it's all a part of the American Century during your section on the 1990s and mid-1990s when you were traveling extensively in the Balkans and Central Europe. Do you think that was the height of the American century? Well, remember that the term American century was um, coined by the publisher Henry Luce way back in 1941 when he was trying to tell the American people who were very isolationist at the time uh, that they were now the largest country in the world and they had to take the responsibilities that went with that, that if the largest country was a free rider, there'd be nothing but disorder. Um, I, it, it, Luce was not successful in the sense that it wasn't until the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor that the people gave up their, their uh, isolationism. But after World War II, the Americans had half of the world economy because all the other countries have been hurt by the war, the Americans hadn't, um, and they remained then the largest country, but they were uh, balanced in part by the Soviet Union, uh, particularly in uh, military affairs. Um, Soviets had troops in the center of Europe and had their own nuclear weapons and so forth. Um, that then changes uh, in the uh, uh, 1991, when the Soviet Union vanishes, uh, uh, Gorbachev resigns and Yeltsin replaces him. And in that sense, people uh, call, talked about the, the the change from a bipolar world to a uh, unipolar world. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the Americans were back in the position they were in in 1945. Uh, so uh, in, uh, the when we were when I was in the Pentagon and we would go to let's say Eastern Europe, um, the uh, the influence of the United States was very considerable. I remember going with Secretary of Defense Perry to call on President Mechevar of Slovakia, who was becoming somewhat somewhat of an authoritarian, and I remember sitting there and with Mechar and, and Bill Perry saying to him, uh, if you continue on this path of tightening down on the opposition and destroying freedom of speech, uh, 
you're not going to get into NATO. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Metchar took that advice. So there, so in that sense, the Americans had a, a, a fair amount of influence in uh, when there was le- there was an unbalanced power, if you want. Um, uh, that obviously declines, or that American dominance declines, uh, and you have uh, the uh, r- rise of China, which becomes the world's second largest economy. And after the American um, generated uh, Great Recession of um, uh, 2008 to 2009, uh, China decides that um, it's going to drop Deng Xiaoping's policy of hide and hide because it thinks the Americans are in decline. And uh, from that point on, things become more tense between the U.S. and China. So as you, as you, if you drew a plot of American power or perceived American power from 45 to, uh, to today, it, it goes up and down. It's not linear down, it's not linear up. Was the 1970s after Watergate in Vietnam a, a down point? In that Very time? definitely. It, 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 after the Americans were defeated in Vietnam, um, the, uh, the the general view was that uh, uh, this was the end of American power. And the the uh, magazine Business Week had a picture of the statue of liberty with a tear uh you know dribbling down from her her eyes um of course that was a down period but it it, it turned back up again in the in the 80s and 90s so um if you've seen cycles like this over a long enough time you become a little bit um suspicious of just projecting uh, the direction that you see today and tomorrow, because uh, uh, it's like the weather in Britain can change any time. Yeah, right. So if it's the uncertainty prevents us from predicting exactly how it's going to go, the last time or the, the final moment when you wrote about it seems like the end of the American century was 2020 during the COVID pandemic. Since then, four years has has elapsed. Um, do you think the trajectory is pointing up upwards? Has the United States been recovering from this disruption to the American century? Well, I think the uh, United States and many other countries, including China, badly mishandled the COVID um, uh, epidemic, and I think that um, uh, was indeed a downer, if you want. But I think. The, if you look at the U.S. economy, it recovered pretty well, and uh, economic growth has been uh, quite robust, and uh, certainly entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial spirit, and the development of new industries, generative AI, for example, um, it, it doesn't strike me as a, a down period in economics. Uh, the big question, I think, is what happens with politics. And uh, particularly the uh, what will happen in November in the election. Um, I've written somewhere that I'm more worried about uh, the rise of populism in the U.S. than I am about the rise of China. Hmm. Right. So um, one of your most famous uh, intellectual conceptions, soft power, was coined by you in 1989 and you mentioned you actually came up with it while uh, sitting at your kitchen table which month of 1989 did you did you write this because that makes a difference well let's let me try to recover it um the bound to lead and it was i was writing about the belief that the u.s was in decline which was mm-hmm. popular at that time uh, paul kennedy the great british historian had written the, the rise and fall of a great power saying that the united states was like uh, philip ii spain or edwardian england or and i thought no that's not right and so as i totaled up american military power and uh an economic power i said there's still something missing which is the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion and uh 
I'm trying to remember. I, it came the book. I started writing the book in early '89, mm -hmm. um, so it must have been later in '89, but before the before the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, because mm -hmm. it, it uh, was basically this concern about that Paul Kennedy had missed something. So it probably would have been the first half of of '89. Right. The book was then published in '90. Right. Um, so after the soft power, you took many trips uh, to East Asia, where the Nine Initiative, along with sm soft power, smart power, became incredibly popular concepts uh, in East Asian countries, particularly in China, where the Chinese government, notably in 2007, asked you, what could China do to improve its soft power? If the same question is posed to you today, how would you respond to that? Well, I think, uh, first of all, China has a great deal of soft power that comes from its traditional culture, uh, which is very attractive. And it also has soft power that comes from the enormous economic success. I mean, raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty uh, makes China attractive. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, what I said to my uh, the Chinese government officials I talked to at, uh, then and we still say today is that China has two large problems in terms of increasing its soft power. One is its um, disputes, territorial disputes with many of its neighbors. Um, it's hard to create a Confucius Institute in New Delhi and make uh, China attractive in eyes if if it Chinese soldiers killing Indian soldiers on the borders in the Himalayas. So uh, the more of these disputes there are, or now it's with the Philippines on uh, about the um, uh, South China Sea and so forth. These limit Chinese soft power. But the other limit um, is basically the uh, intense uh, party uh, control which uh, basically discourages civil society. Um, so uh, if you think of, of American or British soft power, a great deal of it comes from civil society, not, uh, not from the government. Um, and clamp down too tightly on civil society by insisting on tight party control of everything, uh, you, you make that part of your soft power uh, art, art, arsenal uh, less available. Mm -hmm. I mean, the example I often give is Ai Weiwei, who's a, a, a genius as a Chinese artist, uh, but winds up in prison or in exile. That's not the way to increase soft power. But it's also true that both those things that I pointed out, um, you know, territorial boundaries disputes and uh, loosening up on party control, I don't expect to see happen. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask on behalf of my peers for some of your advice, for your sage advice regarding career, career options. In 2003, after a President Bush announcement of the beginning of hostilities in Iraq, you wrote so much for the importance of being a public intellectual. You mentioned the perils of being a public intellectual and the blurry boundaries between being an academic and a public intellectual. A lot of us face decisions between being in academia, uh, working as a public intellectual or as a public servant or even the private sector. So how, based on your experience, how would you advise us on navigating uh, this decision? Well, it, it, uh, you have to go back to the points that I made about time and power. Mm -hmm. If you go into uh, government or uh, private sector, you're likely to have time and the question uh, time problems. And you have questions: How do you balance that with your family life and what you want to achieve over a full life? Uh, so you have to consider that. But on the power side, um, you have to ask: How much do I want to analyze things and get them just right? Yeah. Uh, and how much to want to implement things. And ideally, it's nice to be able to do both, but there's often a uh, a trade-off that you have to face between them. 
uh, my own experience was that uh, getting my academic credentials in place first was more important to me, mm -hmm. publishing referee journals and uh, publishing books that were well received and so forth. Uh, and then from that, going into government, and then going back, one had uh, more leeway uh, than if you just go, if you go straight into, into um, the private sector, you're probably going to price yourself out of the market in terms of being able to uh, afford uh, to uh, uh, either go into government or or into academia. So there, there are trade-offs of all sorts that you have to consider. But um, with, a, with luck, uh, and you can never predict politics, so good fortune plays a, a role in it, uh, you, sometimes you can have your cake and eat it too. But I think the, the concept that I tried to explain to our students at the Kennedy School is what I call uh, uh trisectoral athletes in other words if you're if you're concerned about public leadership which means adding public value to various issues uh you can do it from government you can do it from academia and you can do it from nonprofits but these different constraints that i mentioned uh tipping the balance as you move from one to the other fantastic we're about to draw to a close, so I'd like to, uh, on my end, I'd like to close with this final question. In 2004, when you stepped down as the dean of the Kennedy School, you also received the Chevalier des Ordres de Palme Académique from France and also the Woodrow Wilson Prize for Distinguished Service, among many other prizes. You wrote about this with remarkable modesty. You said, even when honored, humans never seem to feel totally secure. You then visited the Museum of Fine Arts with your wife to see a Paul Gauguin show. And then you said the artist painted at the bottom of the paintings, the questions, where do we come from? What are we and where are we going? Reflecting on your entire career, how would you answer Gauguin's questions now? Well, those are those remain uh, unanswerable questions in one sense, but uh, the where do we come from? I think it's very important to understand uh, our grounds, understand history. Um, uh, we're not writing on a, a blank slate. All of us represent uh, cultures and uh, those represent the history of, uh, that we've experienced. So where do we come from? I would urge people to have a sense of culture and history. Um, uh, who are we? That's a, a central question um, that each of us faces in terms of uh, deciding what our values are uh, if we're in government or private sector and we're asked to do something that we find uh, violates our moral integrity, you have to be prepared to resign. So that sense of, of who am I, uh, you have to know what are my uh, inner moral guiding principles and where are we going is the great question. And uh, as I said at the end of the, uh, of the book, um, I have a faint ray of guarded optimism, but not much more than that. That's wonderful. That's very beautiful. And, and the book is just um, impeccably written with modesty and, and beauty, elegance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your questions. Thank you. I believe we've had some questions uh, that were pre-submitted as well as being asked uh, live right now. So we have a question from Andrea. You have written a book on trust in government. Is it worse now than in the 1990s? Or is it cyclical? Um, effectively, it returns back to the question of Bob Putnam's theory. Well, basically, uh, uh, if you look at the public opinion polls where people are asked, do you uh, uh, trust or have much trust in government? Uh, the big turning point is around uh, uh, Vietnam and uh, Watergate. So early, early, late 60s, early 70s is is a big drop in trust. Um, and uh, then down a bit. But in the late 60s or early 60s, rather, you'd 
about three quarters of the people would say trust New York. But by uh, 75, uh, uh, that had dropped to more like a quarter. So that was the big change. And then afterwards, it, it varies. You go up and down. Right now, I think we're going through a, a, a downer. Uh, uh, we wrote uh, uh, at the Kennedy School, I had a faculty project, which I called Visions of Governance for the 21st Century, in which the first book in the series of books about what was happening in government was why people don't. And uh, it basically said that this is a broader phenomenon. Uh, it, it has triggered by the events of the 60s and 70s, but it's affected other countries and it's affected other institutions. So there's a broader uh, change of what's going on uh, related to globalization and, and uh, social change as well. Great, on a related subject, um... Regarding soft power in the United Kingdom, has that been diminished by Brexit and its uh, the UK's subsequent management of relations with the EU? Well, I I, I personally think Brexit was a mistake. Um, I remember um, having a lunch with Tony Blair at one time, and he said, you know, Britain can play a, a critical role as a link between the European Community and the United States, in the sense that we were part of both cultures. And that was his vision. Of course, that vision uh, didn't last. And in pulling out of the European uh, Union, I think the British made a mistake. I think they're, they're, uh, uh, they're less able to play on their unique position or comparative advantage in each of those two uh, cultures. Um, so I, I think that was damaging for British soft power, but there's a fair amount of British soft power that that's uh, still left. I mean, uh, if you just take the BBC, um, uh, people trust the BBC and they think that it's uh, uh, worth listening to and tell because it likely to be telling the truth. And of course, you have all the trappings of the uh, of the monarchy, which uh, the Americans who revolted against King George uh, still wanted to watch all the pomp and circumstance of of uh, the British monarchy. So there are lots of things in a in a culture that produce soft power. But on the on the political side, I think uh, uh, Britain made a mistake by by Brexit. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding American foreign policy. Uh, Professor, what do you think of the relationship between the polarization of American society today and U.S. foreign policy, uh, particularly its strategy in the Indo-Pacific region? Well, I think the polarization has, is, has been bad for foreign policy. Uh, ironically, less in the Indo-Pacific than in uh, uh, Europe and uh, Africa and Latin America. In the Indo-Pacific, uh, because of the fear that's, that's uh, uh, been in, uh, instilled by the rise of China, uh, you find actually a, a, one of the rare areas of bipartisan consensus. Um, in fact, too much so. I mean, I, there's a, a friend of mine, a, this Australian diplomat, who said everybody in Washington, both Republicans and Democrats, think the Chinese are 10 feet tall. He said the answer is that really five foot eight and the U.S. is about six foot two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but if you have everybody having this 10 feet tall attitude, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, and, uh, you you know, will there be competition with China? Of course, but there can be co cooperation at the same time as competition. Uh, but where you find the greater difficulty is... Um, in Europe, and the idea that Congress held up aid to Ukraine for six months, uh, it was, uh, and it held it up because of uh, a split basically within the Republican Party. When the vote was finally held, something like 70% of the House of Representatives voted for aid to Ukraine. But the fact that it was held up for six months, which gave the Russians an advantage to pursue their invasion, um, 
uh, that I think has a lot to do with this polarization. Do you think that is a dent uh, on American soft power as well? It is, yeah. I mean, if if you have a situation where a president or one of the candidates is talking about America first, implies everybody else is second, that's not exactly good for your attractiveness. Great. Uh, we have a slightly more academic question, in fact. How do you view the overemphasis on advanced methodology, um, particularly those of the social sciences discipline in studying political science and IR today? Well, it, it, I, it, it's good, but you don't want to let it take over. One of the, I mean, there's a lot to be said for trying to be more precise, to use data uh, more effectively, uh, to develop uh, uh, predictive models. The great danger, however, is that you begin to think that what you're seeing is all there is to say. Um, and what you really uh, have to ask is, how do you cope with uncertainty? Mm -hmm. um, in the book, I talk about uh, social science uh, and the tendencies that we have as we're very good at getting good data and making excellent uh, measurements and predictions of islands in a swamp. But when it comes from moving from one dry to another, we have to jump uh, using a, a bridge of theory, which is often uh, not strong enough to hold the weight that we put on it. Uh, and I think that means that when you develop policies, uh, you should rely on social science for the areas where you can, but you have to be very careful uh, not to think that you can explain or predict everything. You have to develop policies that are robust in the sense that they can deal with uncertainty. And uncertainty is going to be there, uh, whether it's COVID or the, the war in Ukraine or whatever, or the war in Gaza. Uh, these are disruptive events, and I don't, uh, I, I think you need policies that ask not what's my optimum solution, mm -hmm. but uh, what happens if I don't get my optimum solution? What is plan B and how robust and resilient am I? Mm -hmm. And because of the unique unique position of the United States in the American century, any uh, anything detrimental to American soft power has been a challenge or a disruption to the rules-based international order as well, such as the, uh, the wars in the early 2000s. So do you think that uh, American foreign policy will continue to wield this power over um, the, the status quo or international uh, balance of power? Um, yes and no. I mean, I don't see, uh, un un unlike some of my friends in Washington, I don't see China passing the U.S. Uh, I think the U.S. is going to remain the the uh, most powerful country. But I think there's a diffusion of power, uh, which means that the Americans uh, are going to be less preeminent than they have been. I wrote a book in 2015 Called, is the American century over? And my conclusion is no, but it's going to be very different from the past. Okay. Um, final question. We would like to end on an optimistic note. It doesn't have to be optimistic. Um, what can the next generation of leaders, or it doesn't have to be American leaders, heads of state, learn from the American century? Well, learn the importance of uh, avoiding hubris and uh, learn the importance of humility. I mean, where we've made our big mistakes uh, is where we've overextended. Um, it, I mean, I think the Vietnam and Iraq wars were both mistakes. And where we've succeeded is where we've worked with allies. The fact that uh, NATO has held together for 75 years is quite extraordinary. Most alliances are relatively short term uh, compared to that. Uh, so when you work with others, when you build institutions, when you make sure you incorporate soft power in your policies, uh, you're more successful than when you think that you can just give commands and coerce. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Nye. Thank you very much for your time. And we've well, learned so much. We're in debt of your knowledge. Well, thank you very much, Siege, for a, a very good um, uh, interview.
And uh, I wish I were as good a golfer as you were. Oh, that's too kind. But I would like to, to play with you or your wife at some point. Yeah. Well, we'll try. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining our call. And uh, we wish you a very pleasant evening.